Pastor Toby last week started the first kind of an intro sermon into our series, The Nine Marks of a Healthy Church. And I'm going to be doing another intro uh, today, talking about what is a church. But I do want to say that in this series, things are going to be interesting. Um, it's going to be a long series. And Toby and I will be sharing a lot more because next week he'll start uh, a series on the first mark. And what's going to happen is he's going to do a series on one mark. And then I'm going to do a series on one mark. And then we're going to go back and forth like that. And so there's going to be a lot more sharing in the pulpit um, during this period of time over this series, which I'm excited about, uh, you know, but I think it'll also be, it's going to be good for, for our pastor because, you know, he's been here for over five years now and preaching week after week. I mean, that gets, that, that takes, that, it's, it's a lot emotionally, spiritually, physically. And so I, I think it's going to be good for him to have even more of a break and be able to rest more in, in those times and, and also to help us split some responsibilities while we still look for, um, you know, a music leader and, and handle all the things that Annie was doing. So, but this morning, we're going to talk about what is a church. Have you guys ever actually stopped to wonder what a local church is? I think sometimes we, all, we just take it for granted. We think, oh, well, yeah, I know what a church is, but do we really think about how do you define a church? I don't know if any of you ever saw this growing up, but um, I remember growing up, there were something that they taught the kids. I don't know if you remember this, but they said, here's the church, here's the steeple, open the doors and see all the people, right? <laughs> you remember that? <laughs> And so if we go by that definition that, that we grew up maybe learning and that, that kids learn, then if by, according to that definition, what is the church? The building. building. Yeah, it's the building. That means this would be the church. But now if you ask for any biblical evidence of the church being defined that way, I can't give you any. Okay, that's a man-made definition. And so no, no building is a church in reality. You know, so it, it would really be better to say, Here's the building, here's the steeple, open the doors, the church is the people, right? I mean, that's, did you guys see that? <laughs> um, but that's, that's really what it is, right? I mean, we, and we should all know that the church is the people of God. We are the church. This, well, that's not even part of the building, but this is the church. We are. And so really, when you think about it, when you look up Riviera Baptist Church on Google or whatever, instead of seeing a picture of the building, you should probably see a picture of us. And, but when we think about there, there's more to defining the church than just saying it's not a building, but it's the people. Uh, when, when you think about the Bible, the, there's this definition of the universal church, right? And so when we talk about the universal church, which the Bible does talk about, we're talking about all followers of Christ of all time. You know, and, and it's true that every that the church ultimately in eternity is the totality of Christ followers who are going to live with their Lord for, forever. But is that the only thing that the Bible talks about? What about the local church? What about a local church? Does the Bible even speak of such a thing? And if it does, how does it define it? How do we determine the difference between a Bible study group and a church, or a campus ministry and a church. And I think it's pretty important that we determine that because it will do us little good to learn the marks of a healthy church if we don't even know what it means to be the church. And so that's what we're going to do this morning. Um, Jonathan Lehman, so the, there's, a, there's a book called The Nine Marks of a Healthy Church that Mark Dever wrote, but um, there's other people that have written little books for the Nine Marks organization. And Jonathan Lehman wrote a book called Church Membership, How the World Knows Who Represents Jesus. And in it, he defines the local church. Oh. Okay. This thing should be on. There you go. He defines the local church this way. A local church is a group of Christians who regularly gather in Christ's name to officially affirm and oversee one another's membership in Jesus Christ and his kingdom through gospel preaching and gospel ordinances. Okay. John Piper defines 
the local church. He says, a local church is a group of baptized believers who meet regularly to worship God through Jesus Christ, to be exhorted from the word of God, and to celebrate the Lord's Supper under the guidance of duly appointed leaders. And I think that both of these authors' definitions are helpful, but of course, ultimately, there's only one author that matters, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we're, what we're going to do today is examine God's word and see if there are criteria that make a local church, and if so, what is that? And so we're going to begin uh, several different places in the New Testament to look at the, the example of the, local, the New Testament churches, the early church, and also some uh, of Paul and Jesus' writings and what they said about the church. And it's, going to be, it's going to be great, and I'm looking forward to this, but before we jump in, we're going to pray. So let's do that. God, thank you for bringing us together today. Thank you for your word. Thank you that, um, obviously, I mean, we thank you for the people who have gone ahead and, and have studied your word and have thought about these things and have, you know, made definitions that incorporate things, elements of your word, but we also thank you that we're not left to just rely on people's definitions, but we get to actually go into your word and examine it ourselves and see what it says about who we are. And that is exciting. And I pray that we would really enjoy that and that we would uh, just love your word and the truths that you give to us. And I pray that we would benefit from it this morning and be rewarded. And we ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. Okay, so I, I invite you, if you have your bulletins, to follow along. There's an outline there that will have notes that you can take. And um, we're going to jump right in, first thing, to Galatians chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. Like I said, we're going to be in several places uh, in the New Testament this morning. But from right from the get-go, in Galatians chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, this is Paul writing to the church of Galatia. He says, Paul, an apostle, not from men or by men, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead and all the brothers who are with me, to the churches of Galatia. And so that initially, Paul, Paul is addressing this to churches. Okay? And so just, just from the get-go, we can see the Bible, when it talks about the church, it's not only talking about the universal church. Okay, there are churches in Galatia. So, if we, I mean, you can find plenty of people nowadays that you can go and talk to, and they'll, and they'll usually these are people that don't go to church, right? And you talk to them about church, and they're like, oh, well, we're, we're all the church. And it's like, well, I mean, there, yeah, there is the universal church, but are we going to follow the Bible's complete teaching on the church? And just ignore a whole other side to it? Because, yes, there is the universal church, but there's also the local church. And so we don't want to, we don't want to do that. We don't want to ignore anything that the Bible teaches and, and define the church in a way that doesn't fit the full counsel of Scripture. And so that's just to jump us off, but that's not actually the first criteria of what makes a church. That's just to show, hey, there actually are local churches. Um, but if we jump into the first criteria, we'll look at 1 Corinthians 1, verses 1 and 2. Again, Paul, writing, he said, Paul called in a, as an apostle of Jesus Christ by God's will, and Sosthenes, our brother, to the church of God at Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus, called as saints, with all those in every place who call on the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both their Lord and ours. And so here we see Paul addressing the church in Corinth. And he says, he's addressing this to those sanctified in Christ Jesus called as saints. And so when we talk about, well, what's the criteria that makes a church? Well, first and foremost, a church is a group of Christians. I mean, that seems pretty self-explanatory. It's a group of Christians. So when, when we talk about a church, that's not meant to... Uh, include anybody other than followers of Christ. And so if we talk about a church, that doesn't include family members who, family members of Christians who personally haven't put their trust in Christ. 
When we talk about church, that doesn't include people who just attend church gatherings, but haven't repented of their sins and followed Christ as their Savior and Lord. A church is first and foremost a group of Christians. And I know you might be thinking, well, duh. Like, duh, Captain Obvious, thanks for the children's church lesson this morning. But, and, and it seems so simple, but sometimes I wonder, like, is it really that obvious? Because if you think about the conversations we have, you've maybe even done this yourself. I, I mean, I'm sure I have. And certainly we've all heard other people. But in our conversations, we might hear someone reference, talk about like the Mormon church across the street or the Jehovah's Witness church down the road. And certainly if we want to define church the way that the, the common vernacular defines it today, which is usually a building, then certainly that could include those places. But if we're going to look at what is a biblical definition of a church, then the reality is there is no such thing as a Mormon church. There is no such thing as a Jehovah's Witness church. Because those are groups of people, religious groups certainly, religious <coughs> gatherings certainly, but they're not gatherings of followers of Christ who have put their, their trust in the Lord Jesus as he revealed himself in the scriptures. Okay, and so that's religious gatherings, yes. Churches, no, not according to the Bible. Because uh, let, me, let me kind of give you an example. Has anybody ever heard of CrossFit? Mm -hmm. You heard Raise your hand if you've heard of CrossFit. Yeah, it's kind of popular now. It's for people who are fit and cross. <laughs> <laughs> it's the opposite of Fight Club because the first rule of CrossFit is to never shut up about CrossFit. Um, <clears throat> I'm just picking on CrossFit people. I've done it myself. But, um, so, interesting thing, though, one of the things about CrossFit, one of the things they battled so hard is to make sure that they keep that name with, nobody gets to use that name without paying their dues, okay? And so, you don't get to just go open a gym and call it a CrossFit gym. If you want to use the CrossFit name in any way, you've got to pay an annual $3,000 licensing fee. And they, I mean, they're on top of it. They don't let you... So you don't get to just open a gym and say, hey, this is a CrossFit gym. Nor do you even get to open a gym and have a class in that gym that you get to call a CrossFit class. You don't get to use the name CrossFit unless you pay your dues. Okay, and so you don't get to just, just because you say something, you don't get to just be a CrossFit gym or have a CrossFit class. To truly be a CrossFit gym, you have to pay your dues. And in a similar way, to truly be a church, you have to be Christian. And uh, you don't get to just have a religious gathering and call it a church. I mean, obviously you can call it that, but just because you say it doesn't make it true. And so first and foremost, uh, a church is a group of Christians, but of course that's not all. And for the next criteria, we turn to the Great Commission, actually, Matthew 28, where Jesus says, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit teaching them to observe everything I have commanded you. And so one of the things that the Bible teaches us is that the first step of obedience as a follower of Christ is to get baptized. And as we will look at later, a church also practices affirmation of one's um, profession to follow Christ. And well, well, let me give you an example. Here's what I mean. Whenever there's like a candidate for church membership, we obviously we want to make we want that person to be a Christian because that's like the very first criteria of being a church is to be Christian. But when someone's presented as a candidate for membership, we as humans do not have the ability to look inside their hearts and determine with absolute certainty that they are a follower of Christ, that they truly know Christ. Therefore, we have to base our decision on their profession to follow Christ and whether or not we believe their profession. And so in order to make that decision, we have to look at the evidence. We have to look at their fruit. And so when the Bible teaches that the first step of obedience is baptism, and if someone was trying to become a member of a church but they hadn't followed the first step of obedience... And that gives us a reason to pause and say, hey, wait, you know, why haven't you done this? Because like, that's like, that's the first step. And 
everything that we see in the New Testament, the evidence is that a church was a group of not only Christians, but a group of baptized Christians. Because the evidence we see in the early church is that people got baptized, like, immediately. I mean, that, like I said, it was, it was the first step. I mean, every, every baptism we see in the New Testament, from everything that I've seen, is it was like the same day. And so, I mean, I'm not saying that that's a prescription that everybody has to get baptized the same day, but when we talk about being a church and baptism being the first step of obedience in Christ, then it makes sense that a group of Christ, a church is a group of baptized Christians, not only a group of Christians. But then again, of course, you could be a group of baptized Christians and still not be a church, so there's got to be more. And there is. <clears throat> And so, for that, the next, we turn to Hebrews 10, 24 and 25. This will be a familiar passage. And let us watch out for one another to provoke love and good works, not neglecting to gather together, as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging each other, and all the more as you see the day approaching. Now, we live in a time when the, the local church is not valued enough anymore. And our, our gatherings aren't valued enough anymore. And you can find this by evidence of all kinds of people across the nation who would call themselves Christians but have no desire to be involved in a local church, which is contradictory. And, and clearly we see this in Hebrews, a, just a command to not neglect our gathering together. And, of course, the Bible doesn't say, hey, thou shalt meet every Sunday morning at 9 a.m. or at 10.30 a.m. Or thou shalt meet every week or every day in order to be called a church. But what the Bible does make it abundantly clear is that a church has a regular gathering. Reg Those words are easy to get mixed up. Regular gathering or regular gathering. I'm going to go with regular gathering. And I might mess that up again. Um, and so, that's pretty simple, right? A group that just meets on occasion is not a church. And most importantly, because a group that just meets on occasion can't fulfill the duties and the mission of the church. And in order for us to fulfill our mission and our purpose, which is to make disciples of all nations and glorify God, we have to meet regularly. That's important. But again, that's not all. You could still be a group of baptized Christians meeting regularly, but that doesn't automatically make you a church. We need to determine why are you meeting? What are you doing when you meet? And to that, we turn to Acts chapter 2 in the example of the early church. In verses 46 and 47, it says, Every day they devoted themselves to meeting together in the temple and broke bread from house to house. They ate their food with joyful and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of of all the people. And this is another example that the early church set for us in the re regular gatherings, and they, they were meeting daily. But it also shows us why they were meeting. It says they were praising God. And we know that our, the purpose and the mission of every church, of every believer, our purpose is to glorify God and to worship Him. And our mission is to make disciples. And so when we talk about what does a church do, why do they gather, it's to worship and glorify God. It has to be. But there, there's more to, well, obviously there's many ways in which you can worship and glorify God. There, there's, there's so many ways in which you can praise God. And, and so the Bible also does give us certain practices that were exampled by the early church as the found, fundamental and foundational elements of worship that a church should be regularly doing. And for the first two of those, we can just go back a few verses earlier in Acts chapter 2 to verse 42, and we can see this church. It says, They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Now, we already talked about the regular gathering, but it also says they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to prayer. And of course the apostles were, what were they teaching? They were teaching the word of God, which we now have as the combined Old and New Testament. And they were praying. And so 
those are two foundational things that when you think about what should a church be doing when they get together, they should be preaching the word of God and they should be praying. And there's one other that we see an example, and we can see that in 1 Corinthians 11, 26. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Of course, what's Paul talking about there? The Lord's Supper, communion. That was the, the, what we would call the church's second ordinance, the first being baptism and the second being the Lord's Supper. And so we see that when a church gets together, of course, you could be a group of baptized Christians who meet regularly, but you could be meeting for golf, or fishing, or hunting, or just to have lunch together. So just because you're a group of baptized Christians regularly getting together, that doesn't make you a church. A church meets to proclaim God's word, to pray, and we observe the Lord's Supper. And those are really foundational to the way that a church worships and what we do when we meet. Um, but still, there is more to it. And for the next criteria, I'm not going to read the passage, but I have a video that will do that and introduce this to you. Hopefully the sound works. Perhaps you've been in church or youth group or a Christian concert and someone gets up and prays, Lord, you have said, where two or more are gathered, there I am in the midst of them. It's a verse that gets used in Christian gatherings a lot, but let's look at the context. Starting in Matthew 18, 15, Jesus says, If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. But if he does not listen, take one or two others along with you, that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile or a tax collector. Whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Again I say to you, if two of you agree on earth about anything they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am among them. The context is church discipline. It's the body of Christ restoring to the path of discipleship an offending brother or sister. The concept of two or three witnesses goes back to Deuteronomy, where the testimony of two or three witnesses was necessary to charge a person with wrongdoing. Jesus is saying in verse 15 that if it's possible to resolve a matter without getting others involved, we should try that first. If that doesn't work, bring a couple of others along to ensure the offender knows their offense is serious. Then it needs to go before the church, and if they still refuse to listen, they should be excluded from the fellowship. So, where two or three are gathered, let there be unity with the mind of Christ when it comes to rendering important decisions. When we understand the text. So I like that video. I thought it did a good job of giving a brief entry in, intro into that passage in Matthew 18, where Jesus is talking about accountability, which is the next criteria, something that a church does. They practice accountability. Or you could call that affirmation and oversight over one another. Another way to say that is a church practices biblical restorative church discipline. And, and we can see that clearly in that passage where Jesus is talking about, because he's, it, the whole context is about confronting others about their sin, holding them accountable. And he makes it clear that the church has a role there. And the pattern that Jesus lays out, he says, hey, first, go to that person personally. Because, I mean, we, we've seen that first, uh, uh, so many of the times the problems that we have are just misunderstandings, miscommunications, and, or just somebody just needs to hear it, and, and then they're like, oh yeah, man, I shouldn't have done that, I messed up, I'm sorry, and then we can move on. I mean, technically, that is church discipline, it's just the very beginning stages. And of course, if the personal encounter doesn't work, then you bring two or three other trusted brothers or sisters in Christ with you. If that doesn't work, Jesus says, take it to the church which gives us a role that the church has, and that is to hold one another accountable. And of course, Jesus isn't talking about the universal church. That wouldn't make any sense in this context. He's talking about one's local church. And we function in that role of accountability, oversight, affirmation. And so if, if someone, and if that process of restorative biblical church discipline has to go that far, then what Jesus says is 
the next step, if, if someone is completely just bent on pursuing their sins instead of repenting, then the process leads to formal discipline, which means removing someone from the fellowship and what we would say membership of the church. And Paul expands more and, and reiterates Jesus' teaching on church discipline in his letters, but we'll get into that later in this Nine Mark series. And uh, furthermore, I thought that video did a good job of um, kind of noting the misuse of verse 20, which says, where two or three are gathered together in my name, I am there among them, which is often used for just whatever anybody feels like would be good. <laughs> Just whatever anybody wants, how, however they want to use it. But that's in the context of church discipline. We shouldn't take it out of that context. And so that verse is not saying any two or three people gathered in Jesus' name constitutes a church. No, those two or three people are part of a church in which the church discipline process is happening. And so that, that points that out there. And so we don't want to misuse that to, to ignore the Bible's teaching on the local church. And so... But there is more. But wait, there's more. You guys remember Billy Mays? <laughs> Today only, we're going to double the criteria for a local church. No, I'm, I'm kidding. There's only one more. And uh, for that one, we turn back to Acts again, the example of the early church. And in Acts chapter 14, we find when they had appointed elders for them in every church and prayed with fasting, they committed them to the Lord in whom they had believed. So again, over and over and over, we see clearly in this text, there's more than just the universal church. And one of the things that was example for us in the New Testament was biblical leaders in every church. And so, now we, there's discussion that can be had about, you know, how exactly does a church structure its leadership, especially with different sizes of churches. There's discussion that can be had about what words to use, pastor, elder, overseer, things like that. But one thing is made abundantly clear. In order to be a church, you must have biblically qualified leadership. That is necessary. And, and when we step back and we look at this, so qualifications of church, so how, how do we know if something, if a, something is a church? Well, first of all, it's a group of Christians, but not only that, but it's a group of baptized Christians. They're meeting regularly, and they're not just meeting for whatever they want to meet for. They're meeting to worship and glorify God. And we saw that that is, is done through preaching God's Word. It's done through prayer. It's done through practicing the Lord's Supper. And, of course, we worship and glorify God in many other ways as well. And we hold one another accountable. We affirm one another's profession of faith, because that's all we really have, is the profession. Only God can look into each one's hearts. And so we have to practice affirmation and accountability there. And we, have, we need to have biblically qualified leaders. And so if we look at all of this, if you remove any one of them, you remove a fundamental aspect of what it means to be a church. And so according to the evidence in the New Testament, this teaches us the difference between a small group and a church. The difference between a campus ministry and a church. This shows us that campus crusade meetings, intervarsity chapters, navigator groups, Bible study fellowships, young life, campus life clubs are not churches. And no Christian should be content with just being involved in groups like that while separated from a local church. Those are great groups when they're connected to local churches. But they are not replacements for churches because they do not fulfill all the criteria, the roles that the Bible says the church should be fulfilling. Okay? And so, I also want to read just a short excerpt here out of um, Jonathan Lehman's book about the local church, and then we're going to close this up. He says, Just a pastor's pronouncement, just as a pastor's pronouncement transforms a man and a woman into a married couple, so the latter four bullet points transform an ordinary group of Christians spending time together at the park, presto, into a local church. The gathering is important for a number of reasons. One is that it's where we Christians go public to declare our highest allegiance. It's the outpost or embassy giving a public face to our future nation. 
And it's where we bow before our king, only we call it worship. The pharaohs of the world may oppose us, but God draws his people out of the nations to worship him. He will form his mighty congregation. The gathering is also where our king enacts his rule through preaching the ordinances and discipline. The gospel sermon explains the law of our nation. It declares the name of our king and explains the sacrifice he made to become our king. It teaches us of his ways and confronts us in our disobedience, and it assures us of his imminent return. Through baptism and the Lord's Supper, the church waves the flag and dons the army uniform of our nation. It makes us visible. To be baptized is to identify ourselves with the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, as well as to identify our union with Christ's death and resurrection. To receive the Lord's Supper is to proclaim His death and our membership in His body. God wants His people to be known and marked off. He wants a line between the church and the world. What is the local church? It's the institution that Jesus created and authorized to pronounce the gospel of the kingdom, to affirm gospel professors, to oversee their discipleship, and to expose impostors. As I said in chapter 1, we don't join churches as we join clubs. Folks, today, decidedly, was more teachy than preachy, and you guys know that I'm typically very preachy. <laughs> but... <clears throat> What I wanted to do today is to strengthen your belief in the local church. Because it will do little good for us to understand what it means to be a healthy church if we don't even believe in the church. The church is not a man-made institution. Think about marriage. We live in a time when the very concept of marriage itself is being questioned from every angle. And much less the religious and biblical foundations of marriage. I mean, you can go on YouTube and watch videos, or go on Netflix and watch documentaries, and people will be giving you the history of marriage. And they will completely ignore anything religious or biblical. It just amazes me. That's bad journalism, by the way. I watched one video in which the commentator said that marriage is a concept so old it predates recorded history. And I was like, he hasn't read Genesis, has he? <laughs> I don't think much predates that, does it? <clears throat> we know that marriage was not developed through society. It wasn't created by man. It is an institution created and defined by God. But guess what? Riviera Baptist Church is an institution created and defined by God. We are not a man-made institution either. And so today, I want you to believe in the church because it is through the church that God has chosen to carry out his plan on the earth. We need to believe in the church. And today we've looked at what you might call the minimum church. What, what are the minimum qualifications for what makes a church a church? But I have some exciting news for you today. Riviera Baptist Church is not interested in only being a minimum church. I mean, I can't speak for all of us, but I know that Toby and I, we want RBC to be a maximum church. We're not only interested in, we don't want to just settle for being a church. We want to be a healthy church. We don't want any member of this congregation to settle for just being a Christian. We want you to be a healthy Christian. And I want you to believe that the church is the way that God has designed for us to do that. And that's what this series is all about. Now we know what a minimum church looks like. But what does a maximum church look like? What does a healthy church look like? And I want us to, to say that, would you, if you're able and willing, would you stand this morning? And I want us to say something together. If you would be willing, if you mean it in your heart, if you don't mean it, then don't say it. But if you mean it, then I want you to say this with me. 
Okay, and I'll say it first, and then we'll say it all together. Okay, what we're going to say is we will not settle for minimum. We want maximum. Okay, so let's say that together on three. One, two, we will not settle for minimum. We want maximum. All right, now let's do it again. With a, a, a big prayer that I've been hearing this morning is energy. We needed energy this morning. I think Wayne wanted some energy this morning. I wanted some energy this morning. I, uh, Friday night, I went with Ryan Moore down to the U of O campus and gave away pancakes to drunk people from 11 a.m. to 1 a.m. 11 p.m. to 1 a.m. Didn't get home till 2.30. I was like, I need some energy too. We need some energy this morning. So let's do this again. Let's try to put a little more energy. All right, we're going to go on three again. On one, two, we will not settle for minimum. We want maximum. Amen? Amen. Praise the Lord, yeah. All right, let's pray. God, thank you for giving us Scripture. Thank you for giving us your Word. Thank you for giving us the local church and showing us what the local church is supposed to be about. Because, God, I don't believe that we can be a healthy Christian without being in the church. And I also believe that it's easy to just have a gathering that does things and meets the minimum qualifications of a church, but very few churches are truly healthy. There are so many churches in our world, but so few are healthy. And we want to be a healthy church. We want to be a maximum church. And I pray that today. That we would head in that direction with everything that we've got. And we ask this in Christ's holy name. Amen.